So thank you for inviting me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so you know the title of my presentation. Probably I should say that I'm from an information science school. Um, I'm a PhD candidate. I'm graduated in June. Um, okay, so the title of my presentation is The Making of Fungible Open Data in Biomedicine. And most of my presentation will be dedicated to explaining you the uh, socio-technical but also epistemic uh, kind of societal uh, challenges involved in uh, reusing uh, genomic data uh, in biomedicine, research genomic data. But before going into that, um, I also want to give you an overview, a short overview of my research values and interest uh, of my the main like influences and methods that kind of informed my research during my years as a PhD student. And then uh, short overview of my collaborative projects uh, because I have done quite a lot uh, in collaboration with other departments. So I want to point out uh, these projects and then uh, uh, we'll give you a lot of details, uh, probably more than what you want to hear about my dissertation project. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so uh, since this is a job talk, uh, um, I figured that I wanted you to know who I am as a researcher, what I care about, and why I want to be a researcher in the first place, because, you know, with all the things that I could do right now, especially working with data and people, why do I want to be a researcher, right? Um, my main uh, uh, interest uh, um, is really in epistemology. Uh, since I have memories, I've been uh, really interested in understanding how people make sense of the world uh, in different ways, what kind of means they use to make sense of the world, and why do we have all these different perspectives, uh, and, and how we end up with different perspectives. So this is kind of what I've always been interested in, and that's also why I probably have um, a master's degree in journalism, um, so it's kind of curiosity-driven. Um, but then, uh, over the last uh, seven years, uh, um, I really became interested in data epistemologies, more specifically, and code epistemologies. Um, and everything started, um, again, seven years ago when I was working as a journalist, and also was finishing my Master in Media Studies. And uh, during that time, I witnessed uh, the widespread, the kind of sudden uh, diffusion of data and adoption of data-driven techniques uh, by Italian journalists. It was kind of a new thing back then, and, um, and this was because the Italian government back then, it was kind of inspired by the Obama's Open Data Initiative, started to release all these statistics uh, and data and demographic and transportation data about Italian citizens. So as journalists, we were very enthusiastic <laughs> about this, and especially you know, I was writing my master thesis, uh, which was supposed to be on this topic, so how to use these statistics uh, for storytelling. And myself, I wrote some articles using APIs from Twitter and Facebook, uh, and you know, and talking about how the already how uh, the network back then was talking about specific and understanding social issues. Uh, but then at some point, I stopped, and I stopped because I realized that we really had no idea what we were doing. So <laughs> as journalists, uh, we had no training in social science research methods. We had no conception of uh, issues of validity, reliability, generalizations, bias in the data. We didn't know anything about these things. And I saw that um, some of us, we were using statistics uh, to make um, kind of a big claims uh, that were not always uh, um, you know, backed with good data sets. And then especially, I was particularly bothered while, um, uh, by one event. Uh, so the Italian government was trying to pass this law on sexual harassment, uh, on the phenomenon of sexual harassment in Italy. And, um, um, and some of the journalists uh, used some public statistics uh, to undermine this phenomenon and showing that it wasn't such a big thing as the people who were like, you know, pushing for this law to pass were saying that it was. So at that point, uh, I decided to, um, instead of writing my dissertation about how to use statistics for storytelling, more kind of about the limits uh, and how the statistics. Uh, so I became more interested in writing about uh, um, statistics than in using the type of this data analysis myself for my own storytelling, if that makes sense <laughs> with you guys, I think. 
Um, okay, and that's also when I realized that, as Manovic said in 2011, whatever, that in our data economy and information society, there are really three emerging groups of people. Uh, you know, the data creators, uh, those who consciously or unconsciously uh, produce all the data, unconsciously like in social media, I guess. Um, the, um, those who have the expertise to analyze the data and those who have the means to access and collect the data. And, uh, and I realized that as a researcher, I was interested in all these topics, uh, and you will see as how uh, issues of uh, epistemology, data production, but also a lot data governance uh, come up in my research uh, across uh, uh, all different projects. So I was never really able to focus just on one side. <laughs> um, so it's these are kind of the stuff that I'm interested in too. Um, yeah, I guess I should also point out that I'm today I'm mainly a qualitative researcher, even though I have some training in uh, programming and statistics and other types of uh, uh, research methods, but I'm mainly an ethnographer. But we'll see something more about it. So influence is a method. I have a pretty interdisciplinary background. Uh, so I study communication, and then I have this master in media studies. <laughs> but uh, over the, you know, during my period as a PhD student, I think uh, there are three main uh, um, areas uh, that really impacted me as a researcher. Of course, information science and classification theory. Maybe some of you can recognize the cover of the book from Bauker and Starr. So, and my own advisor also really influenced me a lot, Christine Borgman, who does uh, a lot of studies in um, scientific collaborations. And but also uh, social studies of data and algorithm, especially critical data studies. That is probably also a field that some of you are familiar with. Um, the other thing is that um, basically I like to say that I have a minor in history of science. Mm -hmm. History of science really, a minor as a PhD student, even though it doesn't exist, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so history of science for me was really, really important. Inform informed my work so much. At UCLA, we have a pretty strong department of history of science, people, you know, like Ted Porter, that, like amazing people working there. And because uh, my work is about how scientists use um, uh, biology databases, uh, um, for me it was impossible to make sense of this phenomenon without looking at how you know, it evolved uh, through time. It was like really impossible, even though it was not required to take more uh, historical approach, but this was really important for me. <coughs> And the second thing is that somehow it happened that a lot of my work is related to issues of race, uh, which was not something that I wanted to necessarily write about, but then, uh, uh, yeah, it just, just keep coming up everywhere. So, um, so st um, I also uh, specialize in the history of human variation, and I'm particularly interested in how uh, the biomedical field uh, think about the issues of race uh, and issues of biological determinism and things. And then everything will make sense <laughs> eventually, <laughs> hopefully. You will see that uh, I have all this interest. So, okay, so let me have some water. Am I talking too fast? Yeah. No, that I have an accent. I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I tend to do it. Anyway. Okay, so just a short overview of my collaborative projects. Um, I like to say that when I joined my department, uh, for the first time um, uh, in my life, uh, I felt that my brain was at home. I had this feeling that I went there and I was surrounded by all these amazing people. They could just get what I was interested in. Especially my PhD cohort was an amazing cohort. We were five or six of us, uh, and we were all interested in the same things and writing about data and social issues. And um, so we collaborated a lot. It was very natural. Yeah, uh, it was not required at all, but uh, it was a very fruitful type of a collaborative environment. So the first event that we organized just after a few months, we started the project was this hackathon event, it was in uh, 2000, early 2015. Um, in this specific event, uh, we invited uh, community members uh, um, from the LA uh, area to come uh, to this event uh, and together we downloaded and analyzed different publicly available data sets 
on police officer homicides, or police officer involved homicides. Um, so our main question was to understand what type of information were out there and how accurate this information were. Um, we divided our collaboration in a uh, few groups. Um, I was leading the data mining to, uh, group. We did some simple, I mean, not maybe that simple, depends <laughs> on your skills, I guess, querying of different uh, data sets. Uh, and what I was, because we had, um, for example, one data set from the FBI that was released from the FBI, one data set collected by journalists, one data set collected by community members. And I was very interested in seeing for a specific time and place uh, how these data sets were reporting um, uh, the occurrence uh, um, of homicide differently. And I found some interesting stuff that I don't have to talk about now, but um, you can ask me questions, uh, or I can talk about this later or with you uh, individually. Um, then we organized another event. This was uh, last year during Inauguration Day. You probably heard about similar events around the country. This was uh, done in connection, in um, collaboration with Data Refuge and EDGI. Um, so during this, uh, uh, this day, we invited, this was an archivathon, as you call it, instead of hackathon, archivathon. And this is a very information science type of <laughs> intervention. Um, in this case, we help uh, to uh, nominate uh, some data sets so that they were at risk of being deleted during um, government transition. Uh, because you probably, as you know, when you change government in the United States, uh, new governments, they all tend to delete content from, uh, public from government websites and to replace it with new content. So um, we, we were very much interested in rescuing and saving both content and data related to climate change. Um, and then I end up, uh, ended up uh, writing this... Uh, this paper with a colleague of mine, with Christine, who was also a PhD student, um, because I, w I wanted to know, again, this is my interest in data governments that always come up, I wanted to know how this is possible in the first place, so why there are no policies that, you know, they protect uh, these uh, government websites from being completely deleted. Do we have anything in place that, like, co um, kind of archives the type of website somewhere beyond the internet archive? And, and again, so we wrote this paper together, which we will present uh, uh, next month, uh, two months. OK, but my main uh, secondary project, uh, that this was a continuously continuous collaboration, um, it's actually this project, uh, um, which was done in uh, collaboration with the Institute for Society and Genetics uh, at UCLA. And uh, this part lab, uh, uh, which is run by Chris Kalti, who is an anthropologist of science and scientific collaborations. Um, I've been uh, joined this group probably my third year, my second year, so it's been a couple of years that we um, analyze and observe how white nationalists uh, understand and interpret results from genetic ancestry testing. Okay? And, um, Particularly, I was particularly interested in seeing how these white nationalists, once they receive uh, results, they are mixed, right? So they're not like 100% white. How they react to these, um, to these uh, results and how they, um, how they try to make sense of it, okay? And uh, because my m uh, main dissertation project is on open data, I was interested in seeing how data circulates in between different platforms. Because one thing that they do, which again, you can ask me question later, is so they download the raw data from the company's websites, right? Because there are these companies like 20CNME that they run um, the um, ancestry testing for you. And then you can download your raw data and you can upload the raw data on uh, third party calculators and they recalculate the data and they give you basically a different result because it's also based on the kind of reference populations that they have, their own um, samples and so on. And apparently it turns out that these alternative calculators, they retrieve whiter results for some reason that is uh, really difficult to tell because <coughs> they're black boxed. Anyway, so this was my secondary project. Um, okay, so this was kind of an overview of my collaborative projects. 
but um, the main lab I've been working on is the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures. I joined this center right after you know, I started my PhD program. And um, so from day one, uh, I was a research assistant uh, with this uh, lab, and I started collecting data at my research community really early. And um, I joined this grant uh, that basically funded my whole uh, PhD life. Uh, well, not this year, but mm -hmm. my, my first three years. Um, the grant is called, uh, If Data Sharing is the uh, Answer, What is the Question? And broadly investigates uh, this current trend uh, uh, in a science policy that maybe you're familiar with, maybe not, which is to make available to the public, to the whole international community, and also to the industry, as much as possible research data. Okay, in our lab, uh, we, have, uh, we are like six researchers. Each of us, uh, we focus on a different uh, discipline. Um, so you have, you know, have a colleague who is working on astronomy data, a colleague who is working on earth science, and so on. So the idea is that eventually, at, you know, at the end of the project, to come together and make comparison between how these issues are different in different domains. So my specialization is in uh, genomic medicine, and I will tell you more about my specific case study. But before presenting my research questions, I thought that I should give you uh, some background, because this is a less uh, intuitive uh, uh, problem compared to other things I wrote about. You really have to know what is going on. Okay, so first of all, I am writing and I'm talking about research data. So these are not clinical trial data. These are research data that are collected to answer specific research questions. Um, and, uh, and I'm saying this because I was at Hicks uh, last week and someone asked me, Ah, what's the difference between research data and social media data? There is no difference. I don't understand why you want to focus on research data as opposed to social media data. And I was like, I think I'm very interested in research data because uh, uh, research data are used for scientific knowledge production, which is a specific type of uh, knowledge production that comes with specific expectations, right? So scientific knowledge production is first of all cumulative, right? We stand on the shoulders of the giants. So it builds up on itself. Uh, and then it's peer reviewed and is validated in a collaborative way, right? Um, so this is the main reason, the one of the main differences between research data and other types of data. Then uh, it's publicly funded. So at least the, the type of data that I look at, that's another characteristic, publicly funded. So it's an investment. So it's a resource <coughs> and basically also a commodity. And then, uh, I read this difference in a paper and I, found I thought it was interesting. While we can say that social media data are found data, research data are crafted data. So this difference between crafted and found. Crafted because, uh, again, research data are collected to ask a specific uh, hypothesis. Also large scale data sets, at least in my community and you know, with the researchers that I work with, not maybe all research data, but I believe there is always a uh, hypothesis in mind. And um, so what I was saying, to ask, uh, uh, right. And then within a specific experimental setting and to ask specific research questions. So, okay. Uh, the second thing that I want to introduce to you is the open data movement in science, which is different from the open data movement in government, for example. So. Biology and biomedicine has a long history of data sharing and reuse, okay? So biology has been doing this for a long time, and I know because, again, I read a lot of books about it, um, but which helped me really to characterize the new open data movement. So how is now different? Two main reason, uh, reasons. First of all, um, now making data publicly available is becoming a requirement by funding agency. So if you want to collect a new data sets, uh, you have to, um, again, uh, you will see that this is specifically uh, what is going on in my case study. But uh, if you want to collect uh, data, you have to um, basically um, you know, demonstrate that you will make the data publicly available. While before, like traditionally, 
the way a biologist uh, share the data is like this. Okay, I'm a biologist, I collect a data set, and then I mine and analyze my data set. I public, I publish uh, publications, and then along with the publication, I release uh, my raw data or some, visual or some summary level um, data along with my uh, publication. And then a bio curator with this um, a figure in biology and databases comes in, uh, harvests the data from the papers and from the uh, open repositories, and then uh, makes available the data to the public. So usually, traditionally, uh, data are released after publication in the traditional, you know, open movement. And it's also very much community driven. Please ask me a question. Just clarification, is the bio curator a human being or is it a, a machine? So for now, <laughs> it's a human being. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> but no, it's actually, I believe it has to, I mean, you never know. But mm, it's um, bio curators they play very important roles because they, they usually there are people that they know biology ontologies really well. So they have this idea of how knowledge is represented and organized. So they harvest this summary level data from publications and then they curate it, adding metadata and ontological terms uh, and relationship, and then uh, you know, they upload it on bioinformatics tools. Please. I just feel like they don't know if they're attached to a specific journal or where is the curator they keep? <coughs> yeah. Uh, so in my experience, and I think um, probably in most of the ca cases, by curators, they work for different platforms. So, you know, like, um, databases, they have their own bio curators who maintain uh, right, the platform and also harvest data from, uh, uh, from different uh, publications uh, and journals. Um, so it used to be more con community driven, open data in genomic medicine, now it's more like it's increasingly required. There are still a lot of scientists that do not share their data, but what I'm talking about are the new grants that have been uh, um, uh, accepted, please. Uh, right, funding bodies, uh, funding bodies, like funding agency. Uh, NIH like yeah, yeah, basically NIH, uh, yes. Basically, yes, because I work with biomedical data, so my case study is an NIH-funded uh, group of uh, collaboration. Um, yes, but I know that also some private foundations are increasingly requiring it, but I mainly work with publicly funded um, yeah, data collections, so, yeah. Uh, any questions now? Is this only in genomics or is this another um, Let me think. Um, I think is that uh, biomedicine is kind of like 90% genomic right now, I think. So, um, yeah, uh, I would say there is specifically with genomic data for sure. Um, yeah, we'll say something more about it, but. Um, and presumably they're only doing this with the yes, yes. Uh, all data needs to be identified. Um, my work is not that much about privacy, the identifications, but there is a lot of work in that they are showing that, yes, it's identified, but to some extent that you can't really de identify a DNA of someone. Yeah. So there is a lot of research in that direction, but for sure, these data are shared with specific uh, identification techniques. Even though, as you will see, my community collects uh, face, face images uh, from children, so that's impossible to identify, ob obviously. I mean, uh, if that's, uh, how do you do it? So, but yes, there are a lot of uh, requirements. They're very careful with privacy. Um, okay, so now the idea is that, uh, you know, uh, data are uh, required to be shared, but also there is this push on making the data available right after data collection. Uh, before publication, before a scientist, uh, before the data creator herself uh, can mine and make sense of the data. Um, the idea is that uh, when the data comes back from the sequencing facility, you have to make it available, or usually they give you six months, uh, which is really not that much uh, to analyze uh, a large scale data set of genomic data. Um, okay. So why uh, all this interest in making this data available uh, requiring to make data available right uh, after data collection. So I read a lot of you know documents and grants, and there are different reasons why different people wants to push for this open data movement. But I think from the funding bodies' point of view, 
there is this idea of a fast, efficient science. We want to make research, especially public research, as fast and as, as, uh, as efficient as possible. So if you have one large scale data set, and I'm the person who collected it, I am the only person who is mining it to ask my own research question, they're not, it's not really efficient. In an ideal situation, you, have to, you want to have 10 other researchers who at the same time, while I am analyzing my own data set, they come in and they ask different research questions, each of them, right, different also from mine, um, or from the same data set. And this is the big promise uh, of uh, open data in biomedicine. The, the idea that you can do that in a way that can be like, so the research process is very efficient and you have a, return on a high return on investment, right? So uh, I believe that from the funder's point of view, it's mainly a return on investment idea. But in order to do that, uh, you have to make data fungible, which is not my expression. Um, actually, Sabina Leonelli, uh, in her brand new book, uh, Data Driven Biology, she talks about this move of making biology data fungible data. I don't know if you have someone from Econ, but you probably recognize that this is an economics term. Um, which basically means that um, you have to have this data um, turn into some commodities that, that are uh, interchangeable and that they speak for themselves. So you have to make this data in a way that anyone can come and uh, trust this data and mine this data even though this researcher did not witness the collection of the data in the first place. Um, so this is, um, so how do you do it? You either try to make them context free or as Sabina Leonelli is saying, you have to pack uh, the data set in a way that can travel and can go into this journey between different research situations. So this is the idea of data packages. Um, okay, and I think I said enough about this. <laughs> okay, so these are my main three research questions. Basically, um, when I was reviewing all this literature and I got very much interested in figuring out what was going on with all this open data movement, uh, I realized that there was, I couldn't find uh, really a paper that was, uh, one paper <laughs> that was describing how people were reusing this data. So it's all about, right now it's a lot about the promise uh, of you know, open data and how do we make this data to speak for themselves and all these things but they couldn't find a description, a typology, a characterization of the actual practices of reusing this data. So, you know, I went into my field and I started uh, asking people and observing them, how are you actually using open data that you did not collect yourself for your own research? So that's kind of my main research question, the first one. And then uh, I wanted to see uh, because uh, specifically in this community is kind of a new phenomenon to make all this data available. I wanted to see all these policies and this transition from requirement um, pre-publication data sharing is changing the way researchers uh, um, they do their you know, research practices. And then, uh, and then I figure out though that these data were reused a lot outside the academia and outside the medical field. And I found it fascinating, and these data were collected to ask biomedical questions, and then they were used in top in context that didn't have anything to do with biomedicine. So I added <laughs> this chapter to my dissertation, which I don't have much time to talk about. Uh, I wanted to tell you everything about everything, <laughs> but um, that's not, not doable. So I'm going to give you an overview of what is my um, thought uh, uh, right now about the first two research questions mainly. Okay, let me introduce you to my community. So this is an NIH funded consortium. Um, there are um, around 15 labs uh, involved. They are geographically distributed uh, around the United States and also they have some collaboration in other states. But um, I visited six of these labs. So the goal of these researchers and they're funded to collect and make completely publicly available, of course, with some privacy. So there are, you know, you have to be to have an IRB uh, if you want to use this data for research. Um, so make uh, completely pr uh, available prior to publication, right after data collection. So you know, 
the data comes back from the sequencing facility, you do some quality control, and then you have to make it available. Um, and they call these data collections themselves uh, hypothesis-free uh, <laughs> genomic data, which I, yeah, I don't think it's really hypothesis-free. And then, you know, by talking with them, they actually are aware of it. Um, this is high throughput uh, data because it's collected with uh, next um, sequencing technologies and so on. Some data types, I'm not going to explain you today the difference between these data types, about whole genome sequencing, expression data from ChIP-seq and RNA-seq experiments, if you're familiar with it, uh, microarrays, uh, all the microarrays. But especially the most reused uh, data types are genome, uh, genotypes and phenotypes from GWA studies, uh, genomic-wide association studies. And I will tell you something more about this specific one. This is a community that is very interesting for me because it's very interdisciplinary. So I talk with computational biologists, the web, wet lab biologists, developmental biologists, uh, human geneticists, surgeon, surgeons, uh, and I think um, that's also why, to some extent, I think uh, my findings can be generalized uh, to kind of the research, uh, biomedical research environment um, today, because you have all these uh, <laughs> different disciplinary configurations. Okay, so G1 studies. So the main idea of G1 studies is to collect uh, large-scale data sets of genotypes, so genes data, sequence data, and phenotypes. So, you know, like images, uh, uh, mainly in this case, uh, images of the face. So mm, how these data were collected? Um, DNA samples uh, and uh, images from the face were collected from over 3,000 Caucasian children. And then uh, uh, the DNA was, uh, was genotype for, for specific SNPs, uh, for specific genetic mutations uh, that they, they were, you know, mm, uh, known to be connected to facial uh, morphology. And then uh, the face, uh, face images were studied to uh, extract uh, metrics, so landmarks and metrics um, that can be used to quantify the face. And then, of course, everything was made available, and the idea was to, you know, for everybody to come mine the data to find a correlation between uh, the uh, mutation in the, um, the genome and specific facial features. The thing about this data set is that this database, um, which, which is called the 3D Facial uh, Norms uh, Database, is that it was highly reused in connection uh, in a network way, in connection with other databases in the world. Uh, they have different populations, like you know, uh, population from Tanzania was used, a population from so different type of ethnicities, or as they say, populations, were used in connection with this data set. So the important thing to understand is that the researchers who collected this data, uh, they do research in the biomedical area, like all of them, literally all of them. None of them collected this data to do anything else than col uh, conducting research in what is called the craniofacial um, research. So they deal with rare, rare syndromes uh, that are expressed uh, at birth uh, um, in the face. Uh, I didn't want to capitalize by using an image of uh, a child with a craniofacial birth defect. Okay? So I show you this poster from this movie because it tells the story of one of these children with one of these, uh, um, one of these uh, syndromes. So this is uh, the context in which the data are collected and what uh, the researchers write about. Uh, this is one example of how you can extract some metrics uh, from a facial image. And uh, you can understand that it's probably not difficult for you to imagine how this data can be reused in all sorts of ways. So once you quantify the piece of body, and it's such an important piece of our body, right? It's the main way we express our identities. It can be used in all sorts of ways. It's just a, obviously a stupid app that wants to give you, you know, your ancestry uh, profile based on uh, your facial metrics. Uh, so, well, difficult to tell. Uh, it's kind of the same idea, but I will show you an example that is drawn from the same data. Uh, this is just I found it, and I thought it could, like, um, I mean, it reminds me a lot. Also, this one, I don't know if it's drawn from the same idea, but I know that 
the, they were the first uh, to really uh, quantify the face and develop these new, really accurate metrics. So I know that these metrics are used a lot. And I would assume that probably, yes, a certain land landmarks and metrics, they are very accurate, so they can be reused in all sorts of ways. But probably the most problematic, in my opinion, way in which this data was reused uh, was to develop uh, uh, forensic DNA, DNA phenotyping techniques, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with. Maybe you heard about this before, but it's the idea of collecting some DNA from a crime scene and then reconstruct uh, the, the face uh, of the suspect, uh, um, all digitally and computationally. And, and well, uh, I know that the research that comes out from this collaboration between, uh, in between, uh, you know, it was integrated with other data databases in a network way and all these things, uh, but informed uh, um, the development uh, of some prototypes uh, um, for this type of research. And this is what the last um, chapter of my dissertation is about. So just to give you an idea of, you know, what is the value in this data that I look at and in these scientific practices. Okay. So, uh, just a few words uh, about my research methods. Um, I don't want to use uh, too much time uh, to talk about this. You can ask me questions later. I collected over 50 interviews uh, with uh, these populations. I spent over 200 days uh, in between these labs. Um, maybe mine is not a traditional ethnography in the sense that I didn't spend time at one site. It's more based on interviews, but you know, I spent from two to four weeks at each lab, though. So I had the opportunity to see all the data collection, how it happened. Um, and then I, I you know, read and analyzed a lot of documents and things. OK, so just to remind you what my research questions were about. So my main goal um, is to, first of all, to understand how the scientists are reusing this data. So these are used practices. Um, so the main, so first of all, I immediately noticed that scientists, when they were talking about <coughs> their, how they use the data and when I posed these questions, they were referring to different things. So some of them, they were giving me some answer. It didn't have anything to do with some other answers. And uh, it took me a long time for me to come up with a typology, with a characterization of these different practices because it's not clear, there is not a language to talk about it. So my first goal was to give them and myself a language to talk about what do you mean when you talk about data reuse. So one distinction that was keep coming up was between what I eventually called background reuse of data and foreground reuse of data. So background reuse of data refers to this traditional way that I already described to you of reusing each other data, which means uh, that um, these are data that are accessed from, um, they're shared, first of all, along with the publications. They're accessed on bio, um, bioinformatics tools. And they're used for contextualization. And mainly, they're visualized. So, um, so yeah, so th this is kind of the main idea. Is uh, these are two um, databases that are used mm -hmm. a lot uh, by um, the researchers I talk with, and also outside the craniofacial community. Mm -hmm. One is the OMIN data set, um, the other one is G uh, the Genome Browser. You probably heard about it. It's a very popular tool, and the way scientists uh, um, reuse these platforms daily, so it's a very common practice. Uh, they mainly go on these platforms and then you know, they type the name of the gene. They want to retrieve all the information uh, that is known. So this is known knowledge. And then they, um, through this visualization, they access this validated uh, set of knowledge around specific biological entities. Um, so they use it to set up their experiments, so before conducting an experiment, or to interpret the statistical findings or preliminary findings from experimental practice. As opposed to foreground reuse. So foreground reuse is where all the promise uh, about open data takes place. It's about running secondary data analysis of uh, uh, others' raw 
data. Okay, we all know the raw data is an oxymoron, but I mean a low process uh, data. Okay, um, so this is this other this like different practice uh, comes with a set of completely different deals. Um, so while for whenever they access others data for background they use the access data that is known and it works as a reference whenever you go and you want to mine someone else's raw data it's more about knowledge discovery the potential of the raw data set is unknown right so you don't know what you're going to find also because remember that as i was telling you all this data was collected was made available prior to publication so not even a data creator knows what she can find in the data. So everything is collected, and the potential is unknown, this is kind of unexplored data. And while uh, data used for background are highly trusted by the community, data are used for foreground. Um, researchers were expressing a lot of concerns over the quality of this data, mainly because they didn't have an historical kind of record that comes with it. They didn't have a reputation, you know? Um, everything was really kind of uh, uh, unknown. So foreground reuse uh, is a very emerging practice. While researchers access others' data in an integrated and visualized way on bioinformatics tools every day, um, whenever I was asking, okay, when was the last time you actually reused, uh, uh, reanalyzed someone else's raw data, it was, you know, most, it was really rare. So it's a very emerging practice, even though it, constitu it, it officially constitutes uh, the real promise of open data movement. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. and I think I said everything I wanted to say about this, uh, more or less. Great. Yes. Um, if you're getting this, that's fine, just tell me. But um, you know, in the foreground case, it's a lot of work to go from that raw data to something. And so Absolutely. typically, the, when you're doing data analysis, you want to get tenure or whatever, you want to get credit for it one way or another, right? So what's the incentive for A, people to produce data that then has to be immediately shared by somebody else to get the results from it, right? Or B, for the other people to say, well, you know, that's that person's data, they're going to be, they probably already done a lot of processing on it, you know, before they released it, and I'm mm -hmm. going to be behind, so why would I work on it? Does that come up in your... Well, um, yeah, this, these are also the questions that I was wondering, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yes, um, so the main incentive, I think, especially in this co collaboration, the sharing uh, came as a um, package with a collection. So the idea was to collect this hypothesis free data. The problem is that uh, obtaining a grant from NIH to collect uh, hypothesis free data is really difficult uh, because you have to show, you know, uh, R1, usually you have to show that you have a specific research uh, um, type of um, trajectory. So the idea was like, okay, we're going to give you the funding to collect these large uh, data sets, but in <coughs> return you have to make everything available after publication. I think, though, it's very idealistic, like it's exactly what you're saying. It's this idea just because it's a lot. Uh, it means that everybody can come. Uh, we should like make it like super efficient, right? It's, it's yeah, it's kind of a uh, ideal practice. But then, as you were saying, uh, the social incentives uh, they're not much there. Um, so, but I will say a little bit more of how these ac these data are actually reused. Because um, well, thank you for that question. Um, the thing is that when I talk with the uh, researchers. Uh, I found a big disconnect in the way they described this practice of running secondary data analysis in a hypothetical way and the how they actually do it. And because it's a social media collective, I created a little meme for you guys. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you for getting it, but <laughs> I was a little bit worried. I know our meme still a thing, I don't even know. It's kind of uh, feels a uh, little bit uh, dated, but anyway, vintage. Um, okay, so the ideal uh, practice in which <laughs> you know, people they describe running secondary analysis, they are like, yeah, so I go on someone else's database, I download the raw data, and then I reanalyze uh, re data to ask my own research questions. And I'm like, okay, when was the last time you did it? <laughs> but like, well, I don't actually do it, but someone else does it. Okay, can I talk with someone else who is doing it? And like, you know, and it wasn't like happening that much, but I knew that they were reanalyzing re others' data. So it was like, 
can you please tell me exactly how you do it? And it turns out uh, that um, this specific community, at least, uh, really values uh, the collaboration with the data creator in, you know, when they reanalyze someone else's raw data. So what they do, they literally call up <laughs> the data, the person who created the data, and uh, with this person, they negotiate uh, the way that it is accessed and reused. Um, so um, the community really value this collaboration with the data creators and data reusers. And in my uh, dissertation chapter, I, um, I then ask a lot of questions once I realized this, which took a while of how exactly, why exactly this collaboration is so important. And it's for many reasons that I don't have time really to describe all of them, but just uh, kind of faster. Um, so it allows for skills and knowledge integrations because most of the data sets are collected by uh, qualitative, uh, <coughs> sorry, by um, wet lab biologists uh, that they have a great understanding of the biological functions uh, behind the data collection. Um, but mostly computational biologists run secondary data analysis, so by collaborating with each other they can integrate the skills. It's also a matter of version control because when you deposit a data set, you deposit this, the data set with all the known knowledge, annotation data, and metadata that you know about the data set at the time in which you deposited. But as uh, Phil Agri was saying, uh, data sets are living things. So the more they, mm, uh, the data creator works with the data set, the more uh, she understands things about it. So if you con contact the data creator directly, you know, <laughs> you have the most up-to-date version of the data set uh, and all the information and variables that goes with it. It also helps uh, for faster access to protected data. We were seeing there are all these issues of privacy. And uh, if you join someone as IRB, you probably heard about this before, it's, uh, it's much easier, especially if you're asking similar questions and obtaining your own IRB. So um, that's another reason why, especially to download data from some platforms, uh, it's, it's faster to do this. Um, it also uh, kind of encourages to develop uh, trust in this high throughput data, unexplored data, because the reputation of the data creator kind of works as a substitute for the lack of uh, reputation of the data set itself. And, um, but then maybe most importantly, it helps uh, scientists to deal with issues of credit attribution because most of these secondary analysis, they end up in co-authorship. So what happens is that you receive both the data creator and the data collector receive credit together for the secondary data analysis. Another thing that I didn't have much time to talk about, but it's a big issue uh, of credit attribution in visible labor, because, um, so it is easy when you hear PIs <laughs> saying, sorry, this is a little provocation, saying, oh yes, all data should be made uh, openly available right now. Too bad that the people who collect the data are usually postdocs, and uh, um, if you try to be a postdoc in biology today, it's really hard. The postdocs I talked with, uh, to they were postdocs for seven, eight years, and it was really hard, and all they have are their data, like nothing else. So for the PIs, of course, yeah, yeah, I mean, let's make everything available for the postdoc. It's like, uh, that's not exactly that easy. Um, yeah, and there are other issues of invisible labor, but we can talk about this later. So, um, so where all of these leaves us? So <laughs> I thought a lot about all these kind of tensions that are going on in this open data movement. And I think that what I'm witnessing is these, uh, the like the competitions of two different like view of what science should look like. So on one side, you have this idea of data that have to speak for themselves. Uh, and there is all this push, especially in the informatics community, to curate the data in a way that you create a separation between the data creator and the data user. Um, so it's actually seen as a bad thing. Like the fact that you have to call someone up to reuse their data, absolutely a bad thing. It's like stigmatized. Yeah, you shouldn't be able to do that. I'm like, why you shouldn't be able to do this? Anyway, and then uh, there is this, uh, um, some funders that they have this funding st uh, strategy that is centered on the collecting new data and make everything av available, um, which leads to all these issues of competition and rush to data reuse, and then also this, uh, 
problems of uh, invisible labor and workforce. On the other side, you have people that understand uh, science and data science more as a collaborative practice, um, where knowledge validation and not just knowledge production is understood as something that we do it together. Really like this idea of, which probably someone else wrote about already, of objectivity as a collaborative practice. Uh, really like to think about this. Uh, and then um, where, where data creators, they contribute uh, to the secondary analysis of the raw data, where um, the funding is about bringing people together, not just about bringing data together. And also uh, where uh, data creators and data users, they receive uh, um, credit for their work, uh, so they end up in co-authorship. So with our lab, uh, the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures, they thought a lot about interventions because, okay, we write about all these nice uh, things, uh, but then, you know, we work with the scientists and we want to help. So we like to think about ourselves as a, some sort of mediators uh, between the different um, visions of science. Uh, and uh, that's why we organize the opportunity to bring together people, um, we organize some workshops, uh, um, uh, surveys <coughs> with the data users, uh, and in my specific community, um, I would like to organize a hackathon event. And my idea for a hackathon event in this case is where you have the data creators that they present their own data sets, and you like deal with issues of uh, um, credit attribution and also how these data sets can be reused. And I really think that could be really valuable to have the people who collected the data in the event itself. Okay, so out of all these uh, monstrous <laughs> dissertation, uh, I have three main papers that I want to write. Um, one is uh, called, uh, which I like my title, How I Met Your Data. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for getting this also. <laughs> so the role of data creator and reuser collaboration in reusing open data. Then uh, a science policy paper which is uh, the making of fungible open data, winner and losers in a fast science. And then I have a STS, so more what kind of... This one is more about these two... So um, like what, what, what are the, who are the winners and losers? Uh, yes, exactly, like what kind of competing views, uh, yes. I mean, not just about the postdocs, but I guess also from a disciplinary con configuration, because I think that increasingly people who have a great understanding of the biology but maybe a lack of computational skills so will be set back uh, by this model of uh, um, science. And then a STS journal paper, which is mostly about my third chapter that I didn't have time to talk about today, which is this idea of how do you create uh, a collected data in a biomedical context and then reuse them to something completely different. And this type of work is especially related to issues of race because uh, at least so far, my understanding is that it really didn't have any meaningful, um, there was not really a reason of having different ethnicities uh, to investigate these uh, syndromes. So, so while race becomes important when you want to reuse it outside the biomedical field to develop all these technologies. So at what point race becomes important basically uh, as a concept? And then uh, because I read a lot uh, about the history of craniofacial the co um, medicine, but also on the quantification of the face, uh, um, and this is a um, history that is related with uh, the history of human variation um, and biological determinism and race and datification of the body and all these things, uh, I have this idea, which right now, of course, is kind of up in the air because <laughs> I'm writing my dissertation, of writing a book uh, that potentially could be called uh, Data Face, how the human face became a quantifiable commodity. Um, so, and uh, like tell all these stories about all these different like perspectives uh, um, on the face. Like, yeah, they came to be together and how they intersect uh, to eventually have a quantifiable commodity that is our face. And yeah, I made it. So we got
Mm -hmm. So the main uh, use that I'm investigating is this, uh, what was it, this uh, uh, forensic DNA phenotyping techniques. But these data were used in uh, all sorts of ways. The other thing was it, used, it is used a lot to develop um, um, technologies and tools, uh, uh, devices related to the face, like headphones design and you know, um, uh, glasses design. But another very interesting application is for the um, automation of uh, uh, diagnosis for rare syndromes. So someone else, uh, um, in, uh, actually in Israel, they developed this app that doctors they can use in remote places where they don't have uh, access to the literature. Um, and they can, uh, with this app, take a picture of the, ch the, the child that potentially you know, has a craniofacial abnormality um, um, syndrome, and then the app retrieves a list of potential syndromes related to this specific phenotype. But that was another very interesting uh, application of this data. Uh, but the one that fascinated me the most was probably this uh, DNA phenotyping thing. Um, so, yeah, um, in this case, um, the knowledge behind uh, the development of these uh, um, technologies uh, was developed by a lab that collaborated with the labs, indeed, as I was saying, with the data creators themselves. So the people who collected the data were not really interested in uh, actually issues of race and because uh, the whole point of DNA phenotyping is dividing people by race, right? So that's the whole point uh, because that's what they want to do to say, okay, you are from this, this that population, uh, it's mainly. Also because it doesn't give you so many details that you can actually identify one person. This is like a kind of a generic representation. Um, so what we're saying? Right, so the data creators, uh, they were not conducting this research at at all, but they uh, co collaborated with different labs uh, that developed this type of knowledge uh, that then was used uh, and uh, then informed uh, the design uh, of these technologies. So there are some startups uh, in uh, New York who are doing this uh, and their main clients are um, police uh, stations, uh, police officers, uh, and I saw some of them uh, some talks. Uh, Actually, one of the data creators, one of the labs that collected this type of data, one of the postdocs, she gave this talk uh, where she basically explained that you can't do this. Uh, that makes like, not much sense from a scientific point of view. And she was saying in her study, she basically did not find uh, a correlation between certain metrics uh, and uh, ethnicity groups. Uh, and then there were some you know, police officers in the room that were as asking questions about it. So how so? Should we trust this technology or no? Uh, so it is used right now. Um, I read a couple of uh, articles that it was used in uh, some trials, but it's still you know, very emerging. It's not um, sort of validated like DNA things. Uh, and uh, even <coughs> though so DNA actually comes with all sorts of problems. But um, and uh, yeah. There is one author, she's in Europe, uh, in Amsterdam, Amanda Charek, that she's writing about uh, these specific issues. And uh, yeah, my work is very much informed uh, by her work. She's an anthropologist, so. Oh. On that note, is the um, data creator, data reuser relationship that you found different when they're in different sorts of institutions? Like, I can imagine it's easier to pick up the phone and have a conversation if it's like two biologists that work at public funded universities on opposite coasts. But what about when it's a, a data creator is a publicly funded biologist at a research university and the reuser is a cop, a social media company, a something like that? Like, what is the relationship like that? Okay, good question. So, I think, okay, one thing I can think about, uh, it depends. Uh, Let's first talk about in, uh, mm, in a university context. In the academia, the main challenge is between uh, people who conduct the research on animal models and people who conduct the research on humans because they have to translate uh, each other's knowledge, but also because they have different types of access. 
So if you conduct, if your lab mainly does research with mice uh, and you know zebrafish and whatever all animal models, uh, um, you can't really have access to human protected data. So they want to collaborate, but then they have to deal with all sort of institutional requirements. So I think that's mainly it. But if you are a researcher, I think usually it's not that difficult to collaborate. I don't think about any other institutional challenge. Um, so the funny thing is that um, with human protected data, you probably heard about this before, if you want to reuse research data for a publication, for an academic publication, you have to have IRB, right? But IRB is for academic work. If you want to reuse it for commercial purposes, you have to guarantee that you're using an uh, anonymized way, you have some requirements, but don't you don't even need an IRB actually, because IRB is just for academic publications. So, um, and so the way it worked uh, based on my observations in this specific study is that again, you have one research lab collected the data. Then you have all these mediators labs that were not really involved, but they're still in a research university who reuse this data to develop some knowledge. And then uh, these researchers, I think they work as uh, consultants uh, for private companies. So you Alex have. Data, like, yes, that's why, exactly, you know, follow the data and you will see what, what's going on. So that's kind of how it moves around. And then yeah. the other important thing to remember is that it's always used in a network way because if you have one data set with just Caucasian people, it's not really useful. So then it's highly integrated with data sets from Europe. And uh, uh, right, the other thing, that's another thing that they do, right? They send postdocs uh, around. So um, there was this postdoc who participated in the collection of uh, data set, uh, data on a different population in Europe. And then she's now working in a lab that collected this data. So then they can integrate each other data and all these things. And then some other set data sets are in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so it's a kind of a network type of a way. But uh, yes, one of the things that I'm, I want to do is you know, indeed like trace exactly how these data moved around. It was like integrated in between different resources. So there is not one way of doing it. I feel like there are all these little steps uh, that you do when you know, people, they don't just it's kind of comes uh, in a, a collaborative, uh, like a natural way. It's not like they have a master plan <laughs> or something. This is very interesting and it's one of the things that I want to look into. I'm not at that point yet, but it's definitely, I know that in biomedicine you have certain ways to define um, populations, right? So they're called population. And um, in terms of the, so in the biomedical research, usually you don't use the term like race, right? You don't call it race at all, you call it populations. And, um, I would say, yeah, they use the name of the place where it was collected, like the New Jersey population, <laughs> which is real population, um, Amsterdam population, the Tanzania population. Um, but it would be interesting to see if there are some variation in the language for sure. It's definitely one thing I will look into. Um, yeah, and also if it changes when you know you're using a different context. Uh, but yeah. So I will. Will they use the Tanzania data set and then mm -hmm. in the United States uh, police department will use that reference of I see, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so one passage that maybe I wasn't 100% clear about is that so there is a difference between the research data that are used to develop the technologies, uh, to the knowledge that informs the technologies, and the reference data sets used by police officers. So um, the research data is all the data that I looked into. But then uh, police officers, they reuse this data in connection with their own reference databases. So they don't use, they don't use their research data directly 
I really hope they're not doing this. Like, it would be kind of crazy if they, be also because the research data sets are about children images. So those informed the knowledge that then is used to develop the technologies, but then they are, mm, the reference data sets are, you know, data sets collected from all of us IDs uh, and driver license. Uh, they are like data sets from like population. Uh, so another thing that, uh, you know, I read about is this problem that then uh, they develop this profile, this picture profile, and then is run against uh, data sets of police officer, data sets that are already biased in themselves, so you have all these issues of bias that they keep like building up. So that's like that. Yeah. Data sets, um, in the studies once they're published, is there any trace of the background data set? Uh, are they cited in any way, or is it just folded into like the question production <coughs> process and then you can it is cited because um, at least uh, uh, for the data set that I look at, uh, usually they say that's actually how I found uh, find out about this, right? I actually found out because someone came <laughs> when I started doing this research. Someone from the community, I think this is interesting, came to me and told me, well, but do you know how these data are used? You should write about this because I think this is problematic. And then, uh, and that's it. That was the information that I had. So my journalistic, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> exactly. I was really happy when this <laughs> happened as an ethnographer. And then, so what I did, I did exactly that. I went to look at all the publications. Uh, and I looked for all the publications that cite this consortium. And then how, that's how I find out. Can I clarify your question? Because I was maybe more interested in this where you were. The question I thought was, can you tell when you use FaceSpace's data where the data came from before FaceSpace? Before like FaceSpace, but... Data, or are they producing the data themselves? Yeah, no, they are producing data themselves. So the, con the consortium is both about the collection of the data and make them available. So, you know, if you, down, if you use data from a FaceSpace consortium, mm -hmm. you have a list of people there who collected the data, who are these craniofacial researchers doing research on rare syndromes. Because if all you're doing with the background data is pulling up visualizations to like cue a hypothesis or a thought, right? Like you wouldn't necessarily cite that. Right. No. Yeah. No. That's <laughs> great. No. That's that's a great question. So another thing that mm, maybe got lost in this process is that actually this data, the the face space consortium, mainly the idea is to make data available at a raw level or a low process level. So they do not have many visualizations tools. Mm -hmm. So mostly the idea is to reuse data for foreground in this specific community. So, but the fact is that that was also for me um, confusing at the beginning because I was asking them, so how do you reuse other data? And they were describing to me background reuse, but they were supposed to do foreground reuse. So that's why I needed the language to like distinguish this practice because I was asking something, they were answering something else. It was so confusing at the beginning. So yeah, thank you. But I know this is like kind of all the inner wind somehow, so. Okay, let's call time. Thank you for coming everybody.